Hello and welcome back to Well That H12. This week we have James Clark on the podcast and we are going to discuss the dissolution of the monasteries. Um, I also ask, how did this com- topic to come about for the inspiration for this book? Above all, because I was very conscious that this was a subject uh, which had not been tackled by historians for many years. I'm sure because of the sheer scale of the topic, we're talking about an episode in Britain's history which touches every part of the Tudor Kingdom of England and Wales, more or less every community. Um, And it's a topic which in some ways was always regarded as enigmatic in that the source materials for this subject are surprisingly scarce, surprisingly thin on the ground. Uh, This is an episode in the history of the Tudor regime that has not left a very large or long paper trail. Uh, Many of the sources are fragmentary and some of the key witnesses to the dissolution of monasteries under King Henry VIII have not left really very many records at all. Mm. So, for example, Thomas Cromwell, Henry mm. VIII's chief minister, a notorious figure, uh, a figure who's inspired novels and, and dramas. Um, in fact, we have very few of the personal papers surviving of Thomas Cromwell. Um, critically, we lack most of his letters. Cromwell coordinates Henry VIII's government during the 1530s, mm. and at the centre of that coordination is the dissolution of... He is monasteries. the power behind the throne. He is the, he is the power. Now, he issues instructions in a vast correspondence, but when he falls from power, it's clear that most of his papers are destroyed, probably by those loyal to him who uh, are keen to ensure uh, that um, uh, the implications of of his his work are not are not followed up. So we've lost a good many of the records. So what what attracted me, I suppose, was the almost the the tantalising prospect of investigating an episode in history where the source material has to be pieced together almost like a jigsaw. Um, and, uh, grab, grabbing at fragments here and there. And it's brilliant to put together, of course. Um, we are going to discuss this topic today, but I want to begin with, of course, to understand how monastic life and mon- how the monasteries... I want to begin by starting a little bit about from the Middle Ages until Henry VIII's time. How did the monasteries function and what were the role in in British society, English society and what were life like was like in you know the monastery monastic world. So monasteries had been in the Kingdom of England and Wales for centuries. So uh, the monastic uh, estate that the Tudor regime confronts is of great antiquity by the 16th century. And England's landscape, built environment, society and economy had grown up around them and with them and through them. So these institutions were bound into the dynamics of social and economic life. They they were almost an organic part of how life in medieval England emerged, evolved, and 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 was played out, um, which is, of course, why removing them, uh, as with uprooting anything organic, it disturbs a lot of the life around it, uh, because they were so organically part of the, uh, the society that, uh, that we see in medieval England. They were very evenly spread across the kingdom of England and Wales to the extent that there really is no part of settled society, whether urban, suburban or rural, which was not in some way connected to a monastery institution. And 
as a result, really, there is no community of 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 people that does not have some contact, direct or indirect, uh, with monastic life. Their their involvement in medieval life in England and Wales extends beyond the religious. They are not just places of worship, but they are places of uh, residence for people who are not monks. They are places of work and they are a source of economic power. They are great landowners. Um, they are employers of labor. Um, they are investors in commercial and in industrial property. Uh, so they have an interest in pretty much every aspect of social and economic life. And they are also sites of cultural activity. So many monasteries um, are places of elementary education. They are also um, places of creative artistic and cultural activity. Many books are made in monasteries and other decorative arts are carried out in monasteries. So they are, in some ways, they are a sort of concentration um, uh, of of medieval life, both both the uh, the more structural, economic, and social aspects, but also the more um, uh, artistic and intellectual aspects as well. And of course, it's because of the monasteries as well that we have the classical history of the English people that you know was written in a monastery by the venerable Bede as well. So it's of course it what hugely significant yeah. for historical understanding. Yes, that that's right. It, in many ways, because they are um, part of the very fabric of life in medieval England, they are also the repository of its memory. They um, are confirming and, and clarifying the historical experience of, of medieval England. Um, yes, from the time of Bede and onward through the Middle Ages, monasteries are the places where most of the annals or chronicles of um, past and, and, and present events are, are recorded. And in fact, they're so recognised as places of uh, social memory that in, in the late Middle Ages in England, the monarchy um, looks to the monasteries to advise on its own course of action. So when King Edward I in, in England um, uh, is uh, planning on attempting to um, take the Scottish throne, he consults the records in the monasteries in order to determine his claim to the, the crown of Scotland. So um, monasteries have a very, very significant role in keeping the record of almost of England's very, very identity. Um, which is why I think by the 16th century, for some people, it's almost impossible to imagine a world without monasteries because they are they are part of that inherited identity that English people have. And also, as my understanding, is that the function kind of has hospital as well for sick, and if you were were sick, you would go to the monastery as well. That that's right. They are um, particularly. It's uh, true to say, I think in urban areas they have an important role to play in providing social welfare um, we know that in times of plague uh, monasteries will in fact open their gates to take in those who are uh, afflicted by plague um, and to care for the, them at a time when of course ordinary citizens would have uh, shunned them um, uh, and in fact, in uh, the 16th century, when the closure, for example, of friaries is proposed, um, some cities um, complain that if the friaries are closed, when there is next an outbreak of plague, there is a real danger to the other citizens because the friaries have been accustomed to taking in the sick and the afflicted and thus protecting uh, the rest of the community. It's um, it is true though. It, it it's often assumed that if monasteries had um, healthcare facilities, that everybody in society 
uh, nearby would have benefited from them. In fact, they were very hierarchical and often it is only um, the um, elite in the community who are given access to that very high quality healthcare that a monastery could provide. So for example, we know that sometimes um, abbeys would have allowed in the um, uh, the women of the social elite um, to be cared for during childbirth, um, but not the women of of, of ordinary um, uh, ordinary families of of, of ordinary uh, society. So um, sometimes I think we have to be aware that we are aware of a sort of romantic view. Uh, of monasteries. Monasteries were um, elite institutions. They were very powerful. They were a source of lordship and economic power. Um, a huge presence in society, but not always an entirely altruistic one for for everybody. So what by the 16th century, what kind of people entered monasteries? What kind of people did they accept to become monks, nuns or abbesses or that kind of people. Well, there had been considerable change by the 16th century. In in the early and high Middle Ages, um, the people who uh, entered monasteries were often a uh, a broader cross section of society. Um, uh, by the late Middle Ages and into the 16th century, particularly um, for monasteries of men, the um, what we would call the social catchment, that is the, the part of society from which monks were recruited, had narrowed. And they are really from the, um, the middling group in society. They are um, men not from titled families, not from noble families, not from necessarily the wealthiest in society. Generally, they were men from the ranks of society that were um, looking to uh, better themselves, to improve their social standing, because a career in a monastery was an opportunity to, um, uh, in fact, to gain influence. If you entered a monastery and you had the opportunity to become an abbot, for example, it would mean you had the opportunity to acquire significant status to become the lord of uh, a corporation that owned much property um, and could exert even political influence. That was very attractive to families um, in that middling space in society that didn't have a noble title, didn't have a great estate. Um, their sons could enter a monastery and gain some of that, um, that status um, by another route. Uh, a monastery career is attractive to men from families who wish to have the benefit of an education because by entering a monastery in the 16th century, there was the prospect of gaining a university education, which would not necessarily have been open to them otherwise. Uh, monastery uh, recruitment was very different for women in England by the 16th century. For women, it still tends to be um, uh, a path for uh, women of high society, women from elite families. So women who become abbesses, prioresses, um, often um, have come from higher status families than, than the monks have done. Um, and we still find women from noble families, sometimes women who are from families that are courtiers, even in, in the Tudor court, who are in uh, entering a, a, a monastery and, and following uh, a monastic life. So Henry VIII himself has family members who are living as nuns in England. Um, and many other noble families have uh, family members who are nuns. That was not the same for, for men. Um, you don't see by the 16th century um, the sons of noble families entering monasteries. So there's quite an interesting social difference between uh, men and women. But what they had in common was that the monastic life was a career. Uh, so most people 
enter the monastery in the 16th century in England um, at um, their teenage years. So you would enter a monastery at the same time as your peers might enter a school or be thinking of going to university. It's um, a career choice you make in your middle teenage years. Um, it was quite unusual by the 16th century for someone, man or woman, to join a monastery later in life. Um, you don't often find somebody in their 20s or 30s or even older entering a monastery in England. It was something that you did um, uh, at the age of, say, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then you remained for your life. So it's uh, what we would regard as a career choice. So in in a lot of medieval movements, when people go to the monastery, it's kind of a form of punishment. I've seen them being treated, especially the ab nuns have been treated harshly in the monastery. So is this not a... Was it was it was not a real accurate that it was it wasn't a punishment necessarily as we see in some medieval movies as they can be quite brutal. Uh, no, that's right. We we've um we've distorted reality in the way that we represent the reasons why people entered monasteries. Um, uh, it's um, of course, it, it, in some ways, it's an appealing idea that um women are put into nunneries almost to um. To constrain them, to uh, as you say, to, to to punish them, or uh, when families um, uh, discard um, a daughter who perhaps has no prospect of marriage, that is not typical either in the Middle Ages or by the time we get to the 16th century. On the contrary, uh, families of daughters and sons are proud of their entry into a monastery and they see it as what we would today describe as a career move as a as a career opportunity as a way of gaining status and influence and we can see that um 16th century families were proud to um tell their neighbors of their daughters and their sons who had become nuns and monks. Um, and it's it's simply not true that it was only um, the youngest daughter or son who entered a monastery. Not at all. On a, often, it was the other way around. In fact, that it was the eldest child of a family who would be given the opportunity to enter a monastery because it represented such a positive career step for them, that the privilege of entering a monastery would be reserved for the eldest uh, child. Um, so we have to adjust our, our outlook, I think, that um, to, to our own 21st century society, which in, in many parts of the world is very secular, the idea that you would send somebody to a monastery does feel to be um, a punishment. But in the um, religious world view of the 16th century, of course, the opposite is true. And, and this would be a great uh, uh, opportunity that you would want to provide to your child um, uh, and, and for your own family. Um, so many of those who are in monasteries in, in the reign of Henry VIII, they chose to be there and their families chose them to be there. Before I move on, I want to ask about the type of abbess because, as we discussed, a lot of noble and especially in the Byzantine world as well, there's when you see read about that the nobility and the queens retired in monastery, they often become abbesses. Was this a title mainly reserved for the nobles and royalty, or was should the, let's say if my hypo, hypothetical daughter that's going into a monastery, should she become an abbess if she was just a normal lowborn woman as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, the abbess um, was simply chosen um, in principle as the uh, the individual best suited to govern the the community. Um, there's no doubt that because it was a prestige position, that external influences would um, shape the selection. So 
um, a well-born woman, a woman from a noble family entering a monastery, undoubtedly her family members would exert the influence they had to see her become abbess. So there's no doubt that a woman with what we would call good connections, good social connections, had a better chance of becoming abbess of her monastery than a woman without those social connections. Um, but uh, it's certainly possible that women um, uh, who were not from the from royal rank or noble rank could become abbesses. And in fact, in England, we do see in the 16th century a surprising number of women um, who are relatively young um, becoming abbess or, or prioress of their monastery. So women as young as, um, but still being in their 20s, uh, becoming uh, uh, head of their, of their community. Um, so uh, there is always um, in, in any church office, in any church appointment in this period, there's always manipulation. There's always um, external influence being being brought to bear. Sexual um, favors could that have been happening as well? Um, there are always allegations of that of that kind. Um, uh, there is a famous dispute, in fact, over the choice of an abbess at a monastery in the in the south of England, in in the county of Wiltshire, which involves um, both. Uh, Boleyn sisters, uh, Anne Boleyn, who becomes Henry's queen, mm -hmm. and her sister, Mary. And there are rumours there, both of them have preferred candidates that they want to see um, chosen. And there are rumours that one of these candidates is in fact um, guilty of um, uh, uh, sexual impropriety. Uh, and eventually, in fact, King Henry himself intervenes and says she must not be abbess because of the rumours circulating about her her behaviour. And it's a reminder that the selection of who would lead these monasteries was considered to be of such importance that it might even be discussed at court. Um, the king might take a view as to who should be uh, who should be chosen. Um, because the links between the, these monasteries and great families were, were very close. Um, but you're right that in other parts of Europe, um, the sometimes there was a almost a, a sense in which um, the royal family effectively had taken possession of a monastery and um, women of royal birth, princesses even, were placed in these positions as heads of monasteries. Um, we don't see that so frequently in the late Middle Ages and in the 16th century in, in England um, uh, in the same way that we do say in, in um, Iberian monasteries, especially uh, perhaps in, in, in the later period. So there, there is a difference there, um, uh, which, uh, which means that there are still opportunities for young women in England to to rise to a, to, to a position of influence. Now, in the next phase, I wanted to say, maybe it's time to introduce, maybe not the hero, but if I may be so bold to say the villain of the story, which is Thomas Cromwell, and before, because he's a key figure to the, to the dissolution of the monastery. So, but before we go to this, I want to talk a little bit about how he came, because it, in my understanding of the biography, one of the more recent biographies on him, that came from a bit of a humble background and it rose to power to become Henry VIII's right hand man and the power as we discussed behind the throne. Yes, he does. He comes from a um a very ordinary background. Um and he we don't know much about his very early life and and early career. We first see him very clearly in the service of Thomas Wolsey, Cardinal Wolsey, who is really the first figure to play the role of, of chief minister of King Henry VIII um, in the uh, early years 
of Henry's reign, Wolsey um, uh, becomes the main power in Henry's regime um, in the course of the 15 teens and then into the 1520s when he's rising to um, almost a kind of supreme power. And Thomas Cromwell is one of a number of young men who uh, are employed by Wolsey um, uh, as agents carrying out his commands across the country. And Cromwell rises to the top of that group of uh, those working for Wolsey. Um, it seems, I think, largely because of his sheer energy, Cromwell manages to involve himself in all of the cardinal's schemes. And he proves himself to be indispensable. Um, I, I think it's often said, if, if, if you really want to be a success in your career, you've got to make it um, clear that you are completely indispensable, that, that um, your employer can't do without you. And that's exactly what Thomas Cromwell does. He becomes um, almost uh, Wolsey's uh, brain, I think it's fair to say. You know, he, he almost does Wolsey's thinking for him. He certainly does Wolsey's problem solving for him. He's trying, Wolsey, to, find, he's trying to find a little Ray O'Reilly. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, um, he, he is this um, consummate troubleshooter. He is able to um, push through all of those um, aims and ambitions that Wolsey has that, that are proving very difficult. Wol Wolsey is trying to build his power as well as the king's in a, in a kingdom which is not easy to govern because Tudor England is a very provincial society. Um, it's very difficult to travel across Tudor England. Um, communications are very slow. Um, outside of the city of London and the centre of government, it's very difficult uh, even to enforce the king's will without um, considerable exertion of power. And Cromwell largely because he's got so much energy, he's, he's tireless, he moves around the country. Um, he uh, is keeping in contact with everybody. He knows what's going on and he feeds that communication back to, to Wolsey. By the end of the 1520s, he has built a position that is so secure that even when Wolsey falls out of favour with Henry VIII, Cromwell is able to survive. Now, that is, isn't is often the case in politics. If you've built your position through somebody else who is powerful, when their career is over, often your career is over too. Cromwell's genius, in a way, is that he's able to survive when Wolsey doesn't. And uh, Henry is able to perceive that Cromwell has a a usefulness in his own right, even though he has discarded the cardinal himself. So by the end of the 1520s, Cromwell is able to bring himself to the notice of the king, even after the cardinal has gone. And over the next few years, he's able to position himself into effectively into the position that had been occupied by Wolsey. So he's able to position himself as the king's chief source of advice and um, uh, chief minister. Um, and in many ways, he's he's um, he's a more a more attractive source of advice for Henry because Cromwell is not a churchman. So he doesn't come with all of the baggage of being a churchman. Um, and Henry, at the point that he is breaking with the Roman papacy, he wants to secure his divorce. Um, having Cromwell's advice, which is detached from any any influence of the church, is is very attractive to him. So, but was a worry for Cromwell when uh, the Wolsey was discharged that this might happen to me as well, or was he? confident that I'm in such a secure position that this is not going to happen to me. 
I, I think he is. I think he is anxious, um, understandably, because the the fall of Woolsey is is quite sudden, and 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 total, and it's it's pretty clear that if Woolsey's health had not declined very rapidly, and of course he dies, that there um, was a real possibility that uh, Woolsey would have faced a trial, possibly even. Uh, execution and um, Cromwell must have understood that he he could have been part of the collateral damage um, of Wolsey's fall. Um, he certainly has built himself up, but um, when Wolsey is is finally um, uh, uh, overturned by the king, Cromwell is not at that point so secure in his power that he um, could have guaranteed his later successes. He is continuing to show himself useful to Henry. Um, and he continues in the early 1530s to um, support the king, to advise, to assist the king in his uh, various um, initiatives in order to build his position. It's really only with the confirmation of the marriage to Anne Boleyn in 1533, that then Cromwell's position does begin to look unassailable. Cromwell, of course, is very good at building alliances in the court and the, the faction, the grouping around Anne Boleyn that has been moving to place if, her. If, if I may, isn't it because of Anne Boleyn that Wolsey falls out of favour at the day, if I remember correctly, or is it before? Well, Wolsey is falling out of favour already because of um, his failure to um, deliver on the divorce. So oh. um, uh, Wolsey um, is, um, of course, a churchman, um, and in some respects implicated in papal authority. And um, uh, Henry wants uh, to move faster and more decisively than Wolsey seems able to um, uh, 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 manage for him. So, yes, um, the, the relationship between the two of them is already strained even before the marriage with Anne is is a certainty. Um, uh, and of course, um, uh, the marriage itself is is not recognized until until 1533. So Wolsey is long dead by by that point. Um, but Cromwell had already started um, uh, realigning himself with other groupings at court. Um, recognizing that uh, I think Wolsey's um, favor was beginning to fade um, and um, Cromwell was um, smart enough in reading the politics to uh, to recognize that he um, he needed to build other uh, alliances and he he continues to um, connect himself to the different, groups competing for influence around Henry throughout the 1530s. And I think that's that's another of his um, successes, that he, um, he is able to connect himself to more than one group around the king, rather than being closely identified with any one. Um, and that enables him to survive uh, longer than most. Um, because those different groups are are constantly um, uh, shifting and changing in the in their the level of their influence over the king. Um, Cromwell uh, almost sort of stands in a middle position between them um, uh, and is able to um, when when the uh, the Boleyn faction, of course, um, falls three years later in in 1536. Um, Although Cromwell had been close to them, uh, he's not damaged um, by by that change, um, and he remains 
able to um to hold his position um remarkably um and, and until 1540 um in spite of the fact that henry himself is changing his outlook constantly henry is a very unpredictable character very unpredictable personality um and and cromwell somehow manages to stay stay uh, almost one step ahead of that so I want to take a look at Henry's view on monsters, because if I remember correctly, Thomas Cromwell is the one who get the idea to dissolve, dissolve the monsters. But what was prior to Thomas Cromwell say, hey, maybe we shouldn't get rid of the monasteries? What was Henry's view of the monastery and the monastic situation in England at the time before Cromwell comes in? Well, Henry Henry's outlook is... Uh, on the church and on monasteries in particular is not what we might expect when we think of his reputation as as the reformer of the church. Mm. Um, Henry, as a young boy, grows up in a family which is very serious about religion and very committed to monasteries. Uh, his father, Henry VII, the first Tudor, and his grandmother, uh, Margaret Beaufort, are both of them very interested in monastic religion, in the particular style of religious practice in monasteries, the uh, what we call um, contemplative religion um, and the strict discipline and the um, elaborate worship of um, a monastic church. And they are great patrons of monasteries. And Henry grows up in this environment and early in his reign he does seem just as committed as his father um his father had um created an extraordinary memorial to the tudor family in the benedictine monastery at westminster westminster abbey and it's henry when he succeeds his father who completes all of that of that work and he ensures that his father's great vision for a Tudor chapel at Westminster Abbey is completed. Now that's the act of a, of a young king who's continuing the family tradition. And Henry, we know, remains close to some of the monastics who had been spiritual or religious advisors to his father. And he's continuing those relationships all the way through the 1520s and even after the divorce into the 1530s. He continues to look to these, these people for advice. So right on the brink of when the closure of monasteries begins, Henry yeah. still has a um, notably strong affection for monastic religion. And in fact, through the 1530s, Henry's attitude to monasteries doesn't suddenly turn against them but rather it seems to um i suppose today we would say blow hot and cold it seems to sometimes be harsh and cold towards them and then suddenly return back to being um quite committed to them so after um jane seymour dies in childbirth uh, in 1537 henry's um immediate instinct is that he wants to create um, a new monastery with which to commemorate um, his much-loved uh, uh, lost queen, um, which is the sort of instinct that his father would have recognised. Um, in uh, 1536, um, he's uh, creating new bishops, and the bishops he chooses are from a number of monasteries. So Henry has, I think we we can only say, he has a very conflicted relationship with monasteries. By the end of the 1530s, it's clear that Henry's enthusiasm for the reformed approach to religion is proving not to be very strong at all. And he is becoming ever more conservative in his tastes. So it's difficult to see Henry as a king who rejects monasteries and sets out to destroy them in any sort of systematic way. Cromwell's attitude is quite different. Cromwell 
is certainly close to many of the the leaders, the abbots, abbesses of monasteries, and we know that he corresponds with them, he visits them. But he is not, in his own person, an enthusiast for their kind of religion. And he is clearly interested in the more reformed approaches to religion, where individual people take more control of their religious life, where they have access to reading the Bible for themselves. He is, um, uh, I think we can probably say, a more moderate reformist uh, Christian, um, uh, very influenced by the humanist view that um, the old church had become quite corrupted and uh, uh, far too powerful, and it was important to return to the the simple faith that is set out in the Bible. And he saw in monasteries more of the um, corruption of the old Roman church than he saw the simple faith. But neither of them set out in the 1530s with the idea that all of these institutions should, should be closed. Rather, um, Cromwell's view is that first and foremost, they should be reformed, they should be improved, they should be um, uh, developed in a way that is more um, in keeping with the, the simple purity of, of Christianity. And in that, Cromwell takes his influence, I think, from, from Cardinal Woolsey, with whom he started his career. Woolsey um, was not opposed to monasteries, but he wanted them to be improved. And I think for some of the 1530s, that is Cromwell's attitude too. Not to close them all, but to improve them. Um, uh, and of course, this is what other regimes in other parts of Europe are doing. They're not necessarily committing to systematic closure, but rather to intervention to improve the quality of these institutions. So I want to know, because of course one part that is essential as well is the divorce to the Pope and the, the Roman Catholic Church. Could this have happened that this closure of the monasteries without, let's say, if the Catholic Church has still been in power over England, if Henry had not, not divorced as a as Zionist from the Church of Rome. Uh, yes, it certainly could. Um, it, uh, because the the closure of monasteries had happened um, in, in previous centuries. The closure because they were considered not to be viable or closure because they were considered to be um, of, of poor quality um, had happened. And um, monastic authorities, so the, the governors of monasteries themselves, had sometimes argued foreclosure. So it didn't require um, Henry rejecting uh, papal authority or uh, the divorce in order to make it possible. And um, in some respects, I think it's important to um, keep the, the divorce and what we call the break with Rome standing apart from the process of dissolution. Um, and certainly, if we look at what the monasteries themselves were thinking at the time that Henry divorced Catherine of Aragon, marries Anne Boleyn, uh, rejects Rome and makes himself head of the church in 1534, monasteries did not think that simply because the king was now head of the church, that they would all be closed. On the contrary, they considered that this simply opened up a new era, a new era in which the church was governed by the king, but the monasteries would still have a place. Monasteries, after all, themselves had a conflicted relationship with Rome and the papacy. Um, monasteries were suspicious of the papacy. Monasteries even argued mm. that the papacy tended to be corrupt. 
um, they preferred in many respects to be governed by the king than by the papacy. The only part of the monastic estate that saw the relationship with the papacy differently were the friaries. They owed their very existence to the papacy. They, their orders, their, their networks had been created under papal authority, and they had an instinctive loyalty to the papacy. But for them, Henry making himself head of the church did not carry the same significance as for the monasteries, because the friaries did not own large properties. So Henry becoming head of the church did not compromise their authority because they didn't have the economic power of the monasteries. So even the friaries don't assume when Henry becomes head of the church that their future is now uncertain. Um, and they continue for the years following um, to assume that their life as institutions within this church now governed by the king would continue. Um, uh, so my argument really is, my way of seeing this period is that above all, Henry and Cromwell want to make the, the king, the crown of England, more powerful um, within the um, the administration of the church. That's their primary aim. They would like to see reform and they increasingly see closure of monasteries as a way of, of achieving that. But it's only late in the decade that they become convinced that closure of most of them, if not all of them, is necessary. And they begin to think of that only because they see the monasteries as perhaps no longer accepting Henry as head of the church. So as long as they think that the monasteries accept Henry as head of the church, I think it's very likely that Henry and Cromwell would have allowed monasteries to continue in some form. Um, at the end of the 1530s, Henry becomes increasingly fearful that monasteries may not continue to accept his new position. And that's when he is more determined to see them closed. Um, so the situation is changing all the time. It's a very volatile situation. What we above all, I think, have to discard is the idea that there was a, a coherent plan, uh, a, a blueprint, if you like, um, and that at the beginning of the 1530s, Henry had a, a plan, a strategy, and he implemented it. It's clear that he didn't. His attitude changed um, uh, and that Cromwell himself didn't have a fully formed plan at the beginning of the decade um, and that many decisions were made um, in the moment in a, in a very short term way um, and that what happened was often very unpredictable. Uh, it's my understanding, I think most people think about this when they come to the dissolution of monasteries, is that the treasury was quite broke under Henry VIII's time before the dissolution. And of course, monasteries, at least the big ones, had quite a lot of gold in them. So the state of treasury, is that a part of why they chose to close it? At least in the beginning, the bigger monasteries that were out there and to just to get treasure into the royal treasury, or is that a misconception that people may have about the dissolution? Uh, so there is an awareness that the monasteries hold both considerable property, portfolios of property, um, and yes, some cash resources. Um, but 
it's only at the very end of this process that the wealthiest monasteries are closed. So if it was only about money, then logically Henry would have targeted the wealthiest monasteries um, uh, as a priority, and he doesn't. Um, we have to understand that um, because monasteries are independent institutions and their property and wealth has come from benefactors, patrons, families in and, in and across England and Wales, it's not um, straightforward that the crown can simply seize that wealth because the nobility of England and Wales have a stake in that, that wealth. So yes, Henry, Henry's regime always needed money, but it was always understood that even if some resources could be taken from monasteries, that was always going to need to be negotiated with the nobility as well, because they would very quickly indicate that before that property came to the monasteries, it was theirs. And they had given it to monasteries as, as patrons. Um, and so, in fact, um, although Henry does eventually take some cash resource from monasteries, in fact, um, the, the amount of money that he is able to raise from their property is, is not as much as is often assumed, largely because, in fact, he has to give it out to the nobility and the gentry in, in, in political society in order to, to maintain his position to, to secure their support. Also, the treasury uh, is um, weakened, in a sense, by closing monasteries because the main source of income for the crown is tax, taxation. And at the beginning of Henry's reign, he takes, whenever the church is taxed, he takes a very significant amount of money from the taxation raised from the monasteries. And of course, as soon as those monasteries are no longer there, they're not there to be taxed. Um, and so it's, in even in the short term, it's very damaging financially for the crown to have all monasteries closed because the tax income that earlier in his reign and in his father's reign, the king had relied on has simply disappeared because um, as long as the monasteries were there, the king could tax the church, take income from them. Once they're gone, and the property has been redistributed, there is no longer the same tax income. And by the time that Henry dies in 1547, um, the crown's income from taxation is a fraction of what it had been at the beginning of his reign. So um, there are, the, it, it's, it's something of a myth that the main motivation for closing monasteries was financial um, because if if your motivation was financial you wouldn't have closed them because you needed the tax income so if it wasn't because we as i thought about to sum it up a little bit he wasn't quite committed to the monasteries and it wasn't really the treasury that was the reason for the settlement and from well as well didn't seem so, so what was the reason that they finally decided that this institution need to be shut down? In the, uh, what 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 caused the final thought that oh this needs to be dealt with? I think the the key uh, is Henry's headship of the church. So we have to uh, think about the sequence of events. Um, there's no doubt, as I've said, that um, Cromwell believed that monasteries needed reforming, as Wolsey had believed. 
and there's no doubt that they see advantage <clears throat> in closing smaller monasteries, um, uh, rationalising the monastic estate in England and Wales. But as long as Henry and Cromwell believe that the remaining monasteries are fully signed up to Henry's headship of the church, as they seem to be when it's first announced in 1534, it's unlikely that they are going to make a move against all of them. And so in 1534 into 1535, they, they want to continue to control them more they want to bring them under the authority of the crown in 1535 um, henry and cromwell introduce a set of reforms to ensure um, an improved quality of of life inside the monasteries and to ensure more royal scrutiny of what they're doing but still they're they're giving every indication that they will continue. But two things happen to undermine Henry's confidence and Cromwell's confidence that the headship of the church is fully supported. The first in 1536, in the autumn of 1536, is a rebellion in the north of England. The rebellion is about many things. It's about the increasing control of um, life, economic life especially, from the government um, in Westminster. Um, the rebellion is also about the, the in incredible influence of Thomas Cromwell, um, and he becomes a, a hate figure. But the rebellion is also about having seen smaller monasteries being shut down in a region of the country where there are not very many towns or cities and where the monasteries, as we discussed earlier, had played an important social and economic role. That rebellion strikes fear in Henry and Cromwell, and Henry is inclined to see it as an indication that maybe people have not bought into his headship of the church as much as he'd thought. Nonetheless, um, the rebellion is put down. Um, and in fact, for many months after, there's no indication that the closure of monasteries is going to be pushed forward with any, any great speed. But by 1538 into 1539, there are enough rumours and suspicions that in different parts of the country, people are beginning to say, maybe the king's headship of the church is not such a, a good move. Maybe things were better when the crown didn't have as much power as it has now. Maybe things were better when Cromwell didn't have as much power as he does now. That Henry becomes increasingly paranoid, I think we would say, paranoid, that the headship of the church that he claimed in 1534 is beginning to be undermined out there in the kingdom, that people are beginning to say, we don't like this, maybe we shouldn't have supported it in the beginning. And rumours of conspiracies and plots are mounting, and it's that that is encouraging them, Henry and Cromwell, to think that maybe as long as those monasteries remain, these whispers about the headship of the church will just get louder and louder and louder. And the opposition to the power that Henry's given himself will, will grow and become a, a serious threat. That is happening at the same time as the royal interference in the in the running of monasteries is getting to a, a level that the monasteries are really struggling to support themselves. The crown is making so many demands on their day to day running, demanding payments for this and that and preventing them from 
running their properties as they've been used to do, that it's clear that some of them are beginning to feel that they can't go on, that that much more of this, many more months of this sort of interference, and um, they won't be able to, to cope with it anymore. Um, and so if you like, there is pressure growing from Henry and Cromwell at the same time that a different sort of pressure, a sort of attrition within the monasteries is making their resolve weaken. And the two um, combined to get together encourages a number of monasteries to say, we are happy to close. It's a referee with the rebellion that this will blow out in all post jail, post jail civil war as the oyster just uh, worry that this is just another rebellion. We're trying to put it down easily. Yeah, it's it's more shocking than it is threatening, I think. I think the um the significance of the rebellion is that it it as I put it, it strikes fear into Henry. There is no danger that um the Tudor regime could have been overthrown. There is no danger that Henry can't put down the rebellion. Um, and it is put down very swiftly. But it it sends shockwaves that are far greater than, if you like, like the number of men who took up arms. Um, so its impact is more, I suppose we might say, psychological. Um, than anything, that Henry had enjoyed um, a period for nearly two years of thinking his great scheme to make himself head of the church has succeeded. And so when there is a rebellion in 1536, um, suddenly he he's panicked that maybe the support that he thinks he has out there in the country is not as deep as he, he assumed it was. And then two and a half years later, by the time we're getting into 1539, that fear that maybe he's not been as supported as he thought he was, that fear is getting to a sort of fever pitch. At the very moment, as I say, that a number of monasteries are feeling that this this new experience of being governed by the king is is not really working. It's it's too costly for them. It's too almost too exhausting for them. And now I want to take a little time to compare the clergy of the monasteries in England versus that of the Habsburg land and the Joseph II. The and therefore, Jimmy, I don't remember if it was your book or in the Derek Bale's biography on Joseph II, which is brilliant as well, but. I do believe it's, that there is some comparison there because unlike in England, it, it was more in the Habsburg and the Joseph II that it was shut down because it was wasn't really significant anymore. They were they weren't this uh, you know I don't, I don't have the words right now, but they weren't useful to the, and they were growing. They were they were this cruelty that we've kind of associate the regime with Henry the Eighth, but it was. They weren't necessary for a crown anymore. That's why Joseph shut them down. So I do believe there's a quite a difference between Joseph II shutting them down and versus Henry VIII's shutting down of the monasteries. Yes, it's a very interesting comparison uh, to make, in fact, because um, uh, as we talked about earlier, monasteries in England and Wales in the Middle Ages and uh, into the 16th century are are playing an important social, economic, cultural role. Joseph II targets monasteries for closure because he believes that they are not useful to society at all, mm. that he considers that they are um, places where um, the monks and nuns are lazy, quite literally, that they indulge themselves, they are greedy, and they perform no service is there some truth to that, or is it just his thoughts on this? Um, I think there is some truth to that in the sense that um, the Habsburg monasteries are 
much, much larger, much more numerous in monks and nuns than in, in England. Um, the English institutions had become quite lean institutions. Um, they, they, they did a lot uh, and they did not have large numbers of monks and nuns. In the, in the 16th century, in Henry VIII's reign, there are no more than about 12,000 monks and nuns. Um, Quite uh, a large number still, though. Well, um, in, a, in a population of, of what, uh, two and a half to three million, it's, it's uh, 12,000 people is not, not particularly not large. Enough, yeah. um, but in, um, uh, I think the, the, the typical estimate for the number of um, uh, monks and nuns in Habsburg monasteries in, in Joseph's reign, it, it's something like 45,000. The, mm, this is a yeah. very substantial... So you've got um, you've got nearly four times as many uh, monks and nuns, and so you can see um, at that point in the 18th century that um, people from the outside looking in at Habsburg monasteries would have felt these are crowded with people. They live a very good standard of living, um, and what do they do for those of us outside? Um, that they were a sort of uh, almost a refuge for the the lazy, but it's very interesting that Joseph makes that argument that that um, these institutions should be closed because they um, they're not useful to society. What he does do with the property and the income from these monasteries is he really does invest that in schemes for society and social schemes. Um, and one of the criticisms that is made of Henry VIII's disillusion is that um, the property that is taken is given back to nobility and gentry. And actually we see very few useful social institutions being established um, out, of the, out of the wealth of monasteries. We don't see large numbers of schools or colleges or um, seminaries, we don't see money going to parishes and to priests. Whereas uh, under Joseph, you really do see those, those schemes that um, Joseph's vision, I think historians would argue now is, is a sort of enlightenment vision for um, creating a kind of um, a much more utilitarian um uh scheme um where um useful institutions for society and education and welfare are created out of monastery wealth um and it's quite remarkable because um by the time joseph dies what much of this has been achieved out of what what does he close maybe seven eight hundred monasteries and we have Colleges, schools, seminaries, new parishes, income um, uh, stipends for priests created out of this monastic wealth. Um, so it's one of the only instances in Europe's history where you get a transfer of property and wealth from monasteries into new social institutions. I feel like Joseph's second is such a misunderstood character, mostly because his brother did not did 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 undo most of what he did again after his reign when he took over. So, and that is of course an episode in itself, but Joseph II is such a fascinating character, and especially as we talked about in the monasteries. You see, unlike in England, England this is and this is a whole other book, I'm sure, that maybe that's I hope coming out soon. But you know, still he is such a fascinating character, a misunderstood character in the history of history that need to be kind of need to be reformed in a way of his own. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think I think you're right, and I think um, he he deserves to be singled out for um, a quite remarkable revolution. It may not have lasted, but it is an extraordinary revolution of um, social organisation to have such a a substantial population and such a substantial um, body of property and wealth to be redistributed in this way. And 
given that this is occurring against uh, at, at the same time um, as the the ancien regime in France is coming to an end and so on, um, it's one of the only instances of the the realization of a of a sort of enlightenment vision of society yeah. that 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 enlightenment notion of of usefulness um of of what we would call utilitarianism that that ideal that that has been created in the enlightenment um uh and and is the product of all of those um mid 18th century philosophers you know uh, joseph's vision for the education of youth is is almost the application of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's vision mm. for education. Um, and there, um, in Joseph's empire, it's being realized, it's it's being put into practice. Um, I I think uh it's 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 a story that is one of those casualties of the the sectarian divide in European history that um, this is taking place in a in a Catholic country. Um, yeah. Most historians who write on um, dissolution, reformation, are writing from a Protestant perspective, and so they overlook the significance of these episodes in in Catholic regimes. Um, and um, historians from a Protestant tradition tend to write about Protestant episodes, those from a Catholic tradition about Catholic episode. episode. No, there's no in between. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so it gets it gets almost lost, I think, in the in the historiography, which is which is a pity. And one one of the the approaches that I, I try to make in my own work in this area is is to is to break through those Protestant and Catholic perspectives, because I think they they have had a limiting effect on the way that we approach the, yeah. the subject. And before we move on, I want to say that Derek Bear's two volume biography is marvelous in highlighting Joseph's career and his his life is such a good biography. Even though it might be a bit tedious to read at times, it's still worth reading reading through his work because it's such an excellent work, one of the best works for English readers out there who want to learn about him. Yes, yes indeed. Yes. But let's move on and we talk a little bit about the process of closing, but let's talk about the actual closure. I'm sorry for the railing a little bit there, but it was I feel like this topic we should just bring up as well in comparison. But let's talk a little bit about you know the actual closure of the monasteries and the process that went through with the closure of monasteries, which has we have led up to this moment just in order to understand how the this process came about. Sure. So um, I think when we look at a, a a site of a monastery today in in England or Wales, and we and we see a, a often a, a, a shattered building, maybe a broken arch, and um, it conjures up the impression of a of a violent process. Um, I suppose, in a sense, disappointingly, the historical reality is quite different to that. That um, those whose local monastery had been closed um, in the course of the fifteen thirties might have um, been surprised by the fact that when they looked at it, they would have seen no difference because the process is very slow. Um, and even um, the removal of the inhabitants itself is a slow process. Um, uh, I think it's often it's often said that some great events, great moments in history, um, uh, turn out to be uh, an awful lot of waiting around, of standing around. And I suspect the experience of a monastery being dissolved in Tudor England was a bit like that. A great deal of waiting around for something to happen. Um, what we know is that the monks or nuns often, after the, the formalities of making a surrender to the crown authorities are completed, that they in fact return to the monastery buildings um, for some considerable time. Um, the men would only be permitted to leave once they were licensed to change their status from monk to secular priest. And that was a process that could take weeks. So even if they weren't continuing to live inside the monastery, they were certainly living nearby. 
Um, so it's an it's a process that that takes um, time to remove the people. It also um, is a process that does not see the demolition of the buildings very quickly at all. Um, how those buildings look today is not a an indication of um, uh, any direct action against them um, at the time. Only a handful of buildings were um, demolished um, at the time of the dissolution. Many of them, in fact, the king orders to keep intact um, uh, for months, even years afterwards, because um, there was no clear plan as to what to do with the buildings. Um, Henry is um, interested in the idea that um, abbeys across the country might be turned into royal palaces. And so a number um, he uh, orders to be kept um, without any materials being removed um, while the um, the possibility of turning them into palace buildings is explored. Um, other buildings are not uh, demolished because the value of the building materials is such that um, it is ordered that they should all be kept in position um, rather than for there to be any damage to any part of the building. Um, so it is a very slow process. Um, even after Henry's death, there are still sites which are standing empty, but more or less intact. Um, uh, I suppose today we would say that um, uh, for a lot of sites, these would have looked as though they were mothballed. That is, they were um, locked up and standing empty but um, they had not been taken down. The buildings were still complete. Um, what does happen quickly is the removal of their treasures, the removal of the um, decorative art, the um, gold and silver plate, um, jewels, um, textiles, very rich textiles. And these items are taken and sold um, and they're sometimes sold within a day or two of the um, uh, the closure of the community. Um, and they are sold from the site of the monastery. And there is a very um, lively trade in these valuable uh, furnishings. Um, and they're bought by everybody um, from, um, from quite ordinary people, um, parishes, Come along and buy textiles so they can use them in their own parish churches. There is, I suppose you could say, a great garage sale of, of treasures. So, so what happened to the people who remained in the monasteries? Because you do write about that as well. So what, what, what happened to those when the monasteries so the, were shut down? So uh, we have to make a distinction between what happens to the men and what happens to the women because mm. they, they follow different paths. The men... As I've said, they um, uh, they are required to be licensed to change their status from monk to what we call secular priest. So that is an, an ordinary uh, uh, priest, like a parish priest. When they get those licenses, they are able, if they wish, to um, uh, to work as priests if they can find a position, and some do. But um, all of those. Um, who have uh, been in monasteries that are closed in the later phase after the closure of the smaller monasteries. They also receive a pension paid out of some of the income of the monastery, which is another reason why the crown doesn't take lots of money, because the income from the closed monastery is used to pay pensions to, uh, to the monks and nuns. So the monks have a pension, which means that if they wish, they can live off the pension um, and not take a position in a church. Um, and as far as we can tell, um, perhaps one third of those um, who uh, uh, are, are released um, live only off their pension, and perhaps two thirds take positions 
in the church. Um, they are, of course, all of different ages, and the older men are less likely to take a position in the church, the younger men, of course, much more likely. Um, for the women, um, they receive a pension, but of course, women have no opportunity to take a position in the church. Yeah. So um, what they do with their pension um, is some return to live with their families, um, some um, come together with other nuns and actually set up house as a group. Um, and increasingly, we're finding evidence that this is quite a common um, decision for former nuns to make that they um, they form a household together as a group of women, each of them receiving their nun's pension. And of course, that's a more economical way of living for them. Um, and it's clear that these women do not always want to return to their family. Um, as I said earlier, becoming a nun was a career choice. Um, uh, so they don't want to... Um, seek refuge in their family they like their independence and they live independently sometimes in groups the other feature for the women is that as long as henry remains king they are not permitted to marry this is another indication of henry's traditional outlook um henry is not a fully signed up supporter of reformation religion he takes their vows that they made when they became nuns. He takes them seriously, those vows of chastity. He does not want to see women who had made a vow of chastity but leaving... Sorry, sorry, leaving... sorry for interrupting you there, but let's say it was a man who wanted to... It was a monk who wanted to get married. Was that okay if, you, if a man who was a monk and he wanted to marry compared to the woman that Helen did not want to marry? Was that okay for a man to get married if he wasn't so wished um, to? Yeah, so they, um, the majority of them don't, but they are released from their vows. Um, as long as, um, so they are, they are released, the men are released from their vows, but they become secular priests. And by the beginning of the 1540s, those secular priests are marrying. So yes, um, former monks and friars begin to marry. Um, it's still disapproved of, but they do begin to marry. Um, it's kind of hypocritical, though. Of course, it is because you know. Yes. Women yes, of course. Know. Um, and some women, we think, and it's difficult to find the evidence. Some women do marry in secret. Um, but um, when Henry dies and his son Edward takes the throne, the attitudes change, and um, Edward's regime is more reformist. And so the men and women can marry openly. But Edward's reign is very short. Edward dies in 1553. His sister becomes queen, Queen Mary. She is a Catholic. And all of those former monks and nuns who've married now have to um, uh, uh, deny their marriages and um, return to living separately. So um, for those that do marry, it is a very difficult journey over the next mm -hmm. 20 years. Um, what we know is um, that only a small number, only a small proportion of these former monks and nuns do, do marry. Um, but there are one or two instances of former monks and nuns marrying each other. Um, so... Uh, we know that um, one of the former monks who becomes a bishop, so he has a career in the in the secular church. Uh, his name is William Barlow. He, in fact, marries a former nun um, and um, they live as husband and wife. But those are those are quite unusual instances. Um, I think in summary, it's also important to say that the careers of those who leave closed monasteries men and women are very difficult for historians to follow they um they do not leave very many records um we know them about them 
only where they leave wills, testaments, where they bequeath their property. Um, and um, we can then know a little bit about how they are living. Um, but those are, are rare documents to find. Um, it's made more difficult in England because um, monks, especially when they are living in the monastery, they do not necessarily use their family names in records, um, but they take other names. When they leave the monastery, um, they then use their old family name again. And so it's difficult to match up the record of a, a man who was living as a monk with the records of men living outside the monastery. They may be the same person, but their names are different. And it's very difficult to prove that we we have identified correctly uh, a monk um, because they may appear in the records after the dissolution with a different name. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the impact of society and how that, which as we spoke about in the earlier of this episode, if you remember, that's far back, the, the, they had children and significance and they were as a hospital they were sick and, you know, they were for you. They, they had a function in society, unlike um, as we talked about in the Habsburg monasteries, but what what were the impact when when in the sick girl, for example? What were, what about the so called health care that we call it today? What what happened uh, with the community after these monasteries closed down? Well, I think those social impacts are the most significant for the dissolution in in England and Wales. Um, there is no doubt that where there had been um, facilities for social welfare. Um, for the giving of um, support to uh, the poor, um, to the sick and the elderly, um, the arrangements that I was describing earlier for um, people in periods of plague, in outbreaks of plague, all of those facilities have gone. Monasteries did um, run a number of, uh, of hospitals, not all hospitals in medieval England. Some hospitals are independent of monasteries, but monasteries did run some. And those hospitals are closed. Um, and so in cities and towns um, where there had been hospital institutions, they've gone and they are not replaced. Again, the contrast with, say, the Habsburg uh, dissolution, um, the resources taken from these old uh, institutions are not used to create new ones. Um, so uh, towns, cities see social welfare facilities stripped away from from their their local environment um schools i think are also a significant loss and an immediate one um if we're looking for the immediate effects of the dissolution we we shouldn't think about demolishing churches because many of them are not demolished we shouldn't think about even displaced people because as i've said monks and nuns don't necessarily move away very quickly but we should think about the loss of these other social institutions. The loss of schools may be the most significant loss because most monasteries provided elementary education um, for so for so that's um, the teaching of of, of literacy um, uh, to children. Most monasteries across England and Wales offered some elementary schooling. And those are closed, of course, with the monasteries. Um, and again, they are not replaced. And towns and cities spend much of the rest of the Tudor period trying to replace those school institutions that they've um, lost. Exactly, if I may interrupt you again, is the literacy going down after the closure of monasteries? Um, it's, it's very difficult to measure because how do we measure literacy oh. um, with the records that we have. Um, I think what's, what's diminishing are the opportunities, the routes into education. Those, those monastery schools had provided a first step in an ed education career for boys, young men, um, which might have led, for example, to university. 
and then to a career in the clergy. So I think it's not levels of learning so much that have changed as roots into education. What what today I think we would talk about as um, uh, opportunity. There is, if you like, an opportunity cost as a result of this, that a, a wider cross-section of society had so been... So it was, it was a sort of scholarship sense. And yeah, monetary. yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So um, in, in Britain today, there is a debate about how when we had um, grammar schools in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, um, and uh, children from poorer backgrounds were given the opportunity to go to a um, a very good school and from there to go on to university. Then in the 1970s, they were closed. Um, uh, it's often said there is an opportunity cost there, that that, that opportunity for poorer uh, students to progress in education was lost. I think that's what we're seeing in 16th century England, that there is a, a loss of opportunity for education. Um, the other... So, I'm sorry for interrupting you again, but is it education um, becoming more elitist after the 16th century? Yes, of, yes, uh, undoubtedly. Elite? Yes, undoubtedly. That um, we, we find a situation in which um, in order to progress in education, you need money. You need perhaps a patron to support you. Um, and until new schools are created to replace all of those that have gone, and they are not really created for generations, um, uh, until they are established, new schools, then there are no opportunities if you are, a, are from a poorer background. Um, the other immediate impact is the destruction of what we might call a kind of cultural heritage, cultural artifacts. Um, monasteries held very, very substantial libraries of books. You, you mentioned Bede earlier, of course. Um, these institutions had been standing for centuries and they had built up very large collections of books, um, uh, learning of all kinds. Um, ancient learning and and new copies of uh, the writings of classical Rome, but also much more recent scholarship, uh, learning, science, literature, history, um, philosophy. Uh, and many, many, many of those books are destroyed um, because the libraries are simply broken up. Um, some books are sold, but more books are simply discarded. Um, uh, of course, because some of the books um, contain um, learning, which is falling out of fashion. And many of the books are manuscript books. They're not printed books. Um, and they're not regarded as um, valuable to keep now that you can acquire printed books. Um, we lose um, certainly tens of thousands possibly hundreds of thousands of books. Um, and this is um, an experience that is different from other regions of Europe. So the, the, the destruction of libraries and the loss of, a, of nearly a millennium of, of book history is, is perhaps the greatest immediate impact of the dissolution in, in England and Wales. And it's it's a distinctive impact because this is not the case in all regions of Europe. Um, uh, in, in the Nordic uh, countries, undoubtedly also, um, uh, there is a great loss of um, book collections when the monasteries are closed. Um, and today, of course, um, we have very, very few um, examples of um, Norse uh, literature, um, given what would have existed in in um, those uh, Nordic monasteries through the Middle Ages. If, if, if I may, again, I was lucky actually to have the Snorri saga we discovered in the 15th century Indeed. because it was it was basically lost. I don't, I'm not sure if it was for us 
the stored in monastic, uh, but it was still lost and they're lucky that it was rediscovered and again found that Snorri Saga uh, as well as in, in, in fact, the um, uh, the uh, uh, um, archives, the uh, the national archives in Norway have done some wonderful work recently to reconstruct fragments of monastic manuscript books um, that were preserved because they were um, in the bindings of later books. Oh. Um, and they found, including, for example, the only instance that we have of um, the rule of St. Benedict, the classic monastic rule, yeah. translated into Old Norse. Um, and that is in a fragment in the um, uh, the Norway National Archives. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, survival to have. But in, in England, um, certainly tens of thousands, perhaps even more than that, um, are lost. And they're lost quickly um, uh, because partly because they are mostly manuscript and they're regarded as outdated rather than printed books, but also because they're seen as containing um, material that is, of course, Catholic, superstitious. Um, uh, and so that that is a very significant loss. Um, what, what's interesting about the impact of the dissolution is that for many people, people who... Um, rented property that had been owned by monasteries, people who uh, worked on land that had been owned by monasteries. Uh, for, for many of them, they would have not noticed significant changes, that there was a change in landlord. Maybe uh, the money they earned from their labor changed. Uh, in some cases, they, they, they did. Um, but in other respects, when, when the monasteries close, their life continues as before. So um, I think we lose um, facilities and we lose artifacts, but the lives of people are sometimes not as affected as we might think. Well, um, if I may, because I, I, I don't know if this is the case in, at least with Chosel Monastery, so in the smart, for example, it wasn't just, but in North Trondheim, I don't know if you've been there, but there's a monast or monastery there called Lundkormen, and it's on an island, and it was has a really fascinating history of its own. It was a monastery, and it, when it was shut down, it was later fortified. It was used as a fortress as well. I do believe there is one in Crystal Sun as well in Norway that was used in the same way as a fortress ah, in the monastery. Was this the case? And this was the coastal monasteries in England. There were some fortified as well. Um, none of them are are literally turned into fortifications. What they do with coastal sites in England is reuse the stonework. Um, so um, the um, uh, Cistercian Monastery on the Isle of Wight, um, so on the south coast of England, is um, uh, the stonework is taken down and used to build uh, fortifications along the coast. Um, and uh, we see um, most of the recycling of stonework in the early years after the dissolution is going into fortifications. But overall, monastery buildings are put to lots and lots of different uses. Quite a number of them are turned into industrial workshops. So um, uh, in London, um, uh, a printer takes over one of the friaries. Um, uh, in other places, um, they use these large spaces to make um, materials like rope, where you need a very large space. Um, uh, they are used for um, uh, weaving um, workshops for, for um, looms to be erected, um, for weaving cloth. Um, so you find them being used in all, all, all kinds of ways. Um, again, in London, uh, one of the sites is uh, becomes a theatre um, because, again, it's a large, a large space. So um, by the end of the 16th century, so by 1600, you have monastery sites um, uh, being used for, for an extraordinary variety of different activities. Um, and of course, 
in England, um, I think it's fair to say perhaps more than in um, in some parts of Europe, um, uh, monastery sites are also turned over into private houses, into, into mansion houses. Um, so we have a number of locations where even the church itself is built as or rebuilt as as a as a mansion for a, a family and so you find um that the the arches of the church are, are have just become the uh the great hall of the of of the mansion house um and so there is a um uh a huge enthusiasm i think for using what were very grand buildings to be the grand buildings of the nobility and gentry. I think you're another round enough there. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to talk with you about this. Of course, before we go, do you have any can you want to promote any social media where people might find you if they have more questions about the dissolution of monastery? So of course we just did uh, this just the tip of the iceberg this book is quite thick as you may see it, but it's highly recommended to read if you find this topic interesting. So you should absolutely check out this book. So where can people find this book if they are interested in learning more about the topic we discussed today? And do you have anything else you want me to promote or links you want me to put in the description below? Uh, well, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure talking to you this evening. Um, uh, yes, you can find the book, I think, in pretty much any good uh, bookstore and, of course, in the usual places online, such as uh, as Amazon, uh, it is now in paperback um, and uh, uh, I'm bound to say good value for money because it's a very long book. Um, uh, it is more than 200,000 words. Um, uh, so and um, uh, there is plenty in there for anyone interested in in Tudor England. You can find me um, on X at uh, um, at James uh, uh, G. Clark. Um, and I do. Um, post on uh, aspects of my research. I've recently come back from um, uh, researching monasteries in Iceland. Um, mm -hmm. I have a project um, on uh, monasteries and the dissolution in Iceland. So um, anyone interested in, in monasteries in other regions of Europe, um, uh, please do follow me because I'm, I'm sharing that project as we discover more. Um, uh, and uh, I do have um, uh, two new books forthcoming in 2025. Uh, one of those uh, specifically on monasteries and the making of medieval Europe. So please do look out for that and I will be tweeting. Oh, Stefan at the wheel. Um, uh, also upcoming, uh, a, a final um, plug is uh, for those of you who know the, um, the magazine Medieval Worlds and Cultures, um, the next issue that is about to come out, and you 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 can buy it in the in 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 hard copy, but you can also see it online, um, is actually on uh, medieval monasteries, um, and um, there is um, uh, quite a bit in the magazine from me, uh, but also from other historians who work on monasteries in different regions of Europe. Um, in the issue, there are uh, features on monasteries in in Germany. Um, uh, again in in um, Scandinavia and in um, uh, in southern Europe so as well as in Britain um, so uh, if the if medieval monasteries medieval books the medieval uh, practice of religion architecture are your interest check it out because you will certainly find something there thank you so much Radian, for coming on it's been a pleasure my name is Alan and this has been the Dark Age we are available on Spotify Apple Podcasts YouTube. If you like this episode, please hit like, share, and subscribe. And of course, check out some other episodes. I'm sure you're gonna find something you may like. This is, we are available. If you are on Spotify, give us five stars. That would be very nice. And if you are Apple Podcast, consider writing a review of our podcast if you want it. And I will try to read the review on this podcast if I see you. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been without H12. Now my name is Alan, and I'll see you next time.